Thanks a ton for joining us. Special thanks to our panelists, Rachel and Eric, who you'll learn a little bit more about in just a couple of minutes. Um, but as Joel mentioned, this is our second intern housing focused panel discussion. And our first one was kind of a lot of topics over the course of an hour. We got to just about everything that we could to talk about starting a program, maintaining a program, growing a program. And we were thinking about, well, what's a good topic for our follow-up? Because we knew we wanted to do one and we wanted to make it a little bit more streamlined and focused. And part of our part of the aspect of one of these sessions, like Joel mentioned, is that you'll be asked poll questions. And in December, we asked, what is your uh, venue's intern housing program? What is your relation? And some said minimal, some said non-existent, some said we're doing things, some said we're growing. So there was a lot of variety there. But I think one of my most, uh, or one of the questions I think was most revealing is, what's your relationship to summer 2021? And about nine folks had an answer that was either we're, de we're definitely not doing it or we're leaning towards not doing it. 13 said we're totally doing it, that we've made the decision, but 18 were still really up in the air and saying this could really go either way. Well, as time has gone on, I know from some experiences that campuses have made that decision. So what's special about today's um, conversation is that Rachel and Eric are both representing a campus or a number of campuses in, in Eric's case, where they've made the decision to attract and host summer interns, or, or at least kick off that process, knowing what we know today. And it'll be really great to hear from their experience and what they've done to help prepare for, uh, all fingers crossed, a really exciting opportunity to welcome back interns and kind of have another revenue generating opportunity for this coming summer. It also happens to be Groundhog Day. Punxsutawney Phil, he saw he uh, didn't see a shadow, so that's six more weeks of winter. We're not going to ask Rachel or Eric to go outside and report whether or not they've seen their shadow, but we are going to pick their brain and help you all formulate the best approach to what you can do based on their experience. And hopefully they'll be mentioning some things that make you really think about what summer 2021 means to you and your campus. So. Without further ado, Jewel mentioned I am Corey Salem, the Director of Sales with Unique Venues and Intern Housing Hub, uh, but I'm going to pass this over now to the panelists so that you can have a better understanding of who they are. So if we're going to start, we're going to start with Rachel. So Rachel, can you share with us who you are and what your role is at your organization? Sure. Thanks, Corey. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here, Corey. So my name, like Corey said, is Rachel DeLuke. Um, I am the Assistant Director for Administrative and Conference Services at San Jose State University here in Northern California in the Bay Area. And basically I oversee all of the administrative functions of our housing office, as well as our summer conference program. And I've been working at San Jose State for the past 15 years. Um, started with the conference program and then kind of grew to overseeing some other areas of housing as well. Wonderful, thanks so much. And Eric, how about you? Uh, what's your role with uh, Capstone on Campus Management? Yeah, thank you very much, Corey. It's great to be here. Uh, I am the National Director of Conference Services for Capstone on Campus Management, which we often kind of shorten to just COCM. So if you hear me say that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and in my role, we've got about uh, almost 40 campuses that we work with across the country. And in that uh, role, manage, um, I think just over 40,000 beds. And in my role, I'm helping all of our sites across the country with their summer operations. And so that includes summer conferences, summer students, camps and uh, internship housing, which is uh, something that we we started about five years ago and have been uh, working on since then. So very happy to be here today. Wonderful. Thanks again, both of you for joining and sharing your perspectives. We have our first poll up and we're going to gather some more information that's going to help us better understand who's in the audience today. So while we're still collecting that, I'm going to ask Rachel, um, so what does a, a normal summer look like for your program at San Jose State? So not 2020, but maybe 2019 and, and before that, I know that you said that you've been doing this 
um, since about 2007. So you've got into 2019, you know, 12 good years under your belt. So what did a normal year look like for you? Sure. Um, so we have a little bit more about San Jose State. We currently have six residence halls and they're all very different. We have um, two traditional style halls, one suite style and three basically apartment style buildings. So a lot of different options for groups and conferences and interns to choose from. Um, we have about 4,200 bed spaces that we um, utilize or try to utilize in the summer. Um, like Corey said, we have been doing intern housing since 2007. Um, that year we opened the three new apartment buildings. Um, well, the previous year, previous to that summer, we just opened those buildings. It was 2000 bed spaces, which was quite a lot. And so the university said, what are some ways we can fill these spaces? What can we do? Being in the Bay Area, we were in a good location because obviously a lot of tech companies are here and they house a lot of interns. So we started reaching out to these companies um, to see if any of their interns needed housing. It was, I think a little bit of a slow start at first because at the time it was a lot easier to lease apartments on a month by month basis. But as, as time has gone on and we've grown our program, we find that we get more and more interns now because apartments are not leasing, at least in our area, on a month by month basis. So it's harder for interns to find the temporary housing that they need while they're here in the Bay Area for 12 weeks, 14 weeks at the most. Um, so we started small, um, probably about 20 interns, um, and some of it was even year round because we had the space. But now typically um, it's not year round. Obviously our halls are full with residents during the academic year. But in the summer, we do house about 50 interns in our traditional style residence hall, which is just a double or single room with a bathroom down the hallway. Some choose this option because their companies provide meals for them all day and they're gone all day, so they, they don't need the apartment. And then we house about 150 to, to 200 in our apartment style housing. So they live in four bedroom single apartments. Um, where they do have a kitchen and a living room, but they are they are sharing that space um, with others. Um, so that's typically what it would look like for our intern housing. On top of that, we do tend to house between 45 to 55 conference groups each summer as well. Um, some local, international, and some from across the country. Sounds busy. Let's yeah. get back to that time. A typical summer is busy. 2019 was very busy. Last year, unfortunately, not so much. Not so much. But we're, we're think, again, fingers crossed, hoping to get back to that point with this summer. Thanks for yes. that context. Um, I, I think, and I mentioned this kind of in our pre-conversation before we launched this, you know, unique venues and, and intern housing hub and the consultation work that we've done with intern housing, that's still kind of fresh to us since 2015, 2016. Um, so it's really, it's a refreshing perspective to hear from someone in, in a program that's been established as long as what you've been able to do at San Jose State. Um, and Eric, so, you know, you mentioned being at COCM, you're not focused on just one venue, you're focused on multiple venues, multiple beds. And I guess my question for you, um, do all 40 of your venues host summer interns? And I guess my follow-up to that is, depending on whatever number that is, how do you see relocation interest regionally across the U.S. in your venues? And how do you kind of plan for that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we do not do internship housing or even conferences at all of our sites. And so it's really a, a site-by-site determination on what is happening there. And... Um, the way that our, our, we're set up is that um, we only manage housing that is on campus. So we are directly partnered with the college or university to help run their, their housing for them. And so everything that we do is in partnership with the university. And so different universities have different needs, expectations of what summer looks like. And that really drives what our, our summers look like at individual sites. Um, right now, we do some level of conferences at probably about half of our sites, so 2025. And we are doing internship housing at 
about half of that. So probably 10 ish um, mm. is where we're, we're doing internship housing. And it's, we've got kind of all levels of sites. So we have some that are just now getting into internship housing. And this, is, this will be potentially the first summer that they're doing it. Whereas we have other sites that have been doing it for five, six, seven, eight years and have big and, and um, established programs. And, um, you know, just from a, a, a cost perspective and a revenue perspective, um, with our conferences, right? Like you're just having to constantly turn beds. There's a lot more personnel expense. There's a lot more um, cleaning and everything you've got to do to turn those rooms. Whereas if you can get an intern in at the front end of the summer and have them there for 10 to 12 weeks, and then you're just turning that space at the end of the summer, it's a lot better value proposition. And so um, we've really been working with our sites to try to get more and more of them to uh, start looking at internship housing as a, a summer revenue option. And, um, but just, you know, I think we all know on our campuses that change can be hard and takes time. And so when you've got a established conference program, it's sometimes hard to kind of look at doing that differently. Um, so, you know, we really work with all of our campuses individually, though, to determine what's best for their site, their location, and what their needs are. Um, so that's kind of the first part. But in terms of what we're seeing um, across the country, we've got uh, sites in rural locations, um, kind of middle-sized, and then urban locations. And the biggest driver has actually been um, on a state-by-state -state basis and how the, the states and municipalities have been responding to issues of COVID. So in locations where they've been more leaning towards more um, strict lockdowns, that is then rippling through and having a pretty big impact on what things are looking like. So, um, and especially for the, the businesses in those locations that potentially might be hosting internships. So what we saw last summer was um, probably about 95% of the folks that we had who had signed agreements that we were planning on having for interns for the summer, probably about 95% of those ended up having sites that moved their internships online. And mm -hmm. so they were able to still participate in the internship but didn't have to relocate. Uh, we've definitely heard from those businesses and the interns that it is important to get back to a on-site internship, that that is important to the experience and that is important to um, the businesses and the interns. And especially for the organizations that host these interns, this is a, a huge feeder pool for their recruitment. So, you know, once these individuals do interns, they're going to then graduate and this becomes a big feeder for them to recruit new talent to their organizations after they've finished school. And so we're really seeing a big desire to get back into that. But we're also just seeing a lot of hesitancy about what are the next steps going to be. And a lot of that, again, is not being driven so much by the organization so much as it is about what is feasible locally and what what makes sense. So a lot of these companies still have people working remotely. And so if your entire workforce or a large percentage of your workforce is working remotely, it doesn't make a lot of sense to bring interns in and not have any people in your offices to do anything with. Um, the one exception that I would say, and I think that this is a great place in terms of recruitment for interns, if you're starting a program or trying to kind of reconfigure yours is healthcare. So um, most communities have a hospital or hospitals or other research that's happening that's related to healthcare. And we anticipate all of those to be moving forward with in-person internships this summer. And it's, it's obviously that's a very important aspect of the training for individuals that are in the medical professions, but then also just the need right now. Um, and those are actually what I've seen at our sites, those are the contracts that we're getting signed immediately, are people that are coming in for internships that are related to healthcare 
um, in some fashion. So people are signing those. They're not afraid. They're we're coming. We're going to be there. Um, it's individuals that are uh, doing internships that are maybe tech related or business that there just seems to be a lot more um, uncertainty about. And so that's healthcare is one of the areas that we're really pushing at our sites is making contact with hospitals and other research, other things that are in the healthcare field, because it looks like those are moving forward. So that's kind of the big picture of what we're seeing around the country right now. That's a really great perspective. And I appreciate you uh, sharing that and, and going to that level of detail. And, you know, I, I don't, I'd be lying if I said that that surprises me. I think that that's what I would kind of expect to, to or at least imagine what the picture looks like as well as you're, you're preparing for this and getting your marketing and your outreach prepared to host those kinds of interns. Um, Jewel shared the poll results um, from our opening poll, which is going to give us a clearer picture of uh, our audience today. And it looks to me like about 26% don't really have an existing intern housing program. And then there's varying levels of, of the program above that. Some they're just starting out, some it's growing, some it's stable, and some is well established. Um, the majority of folks are looking at intern housing revenue as something that's going to, you know, come in alongside conference and event revenue, not something to completely replace or overtake. But I think this is the one that I was really eager to see is what, how, how our attendees have made the decision for summer 2021. And it looks to me like 72% in some capacity are hosting or are leaning to host interns this summer. 18 or excuse me 28 percent are definitely not or leaning toward not hosting interns so that's kind of the picture of the group um who we're speaking with today uh so let's just dive in to this question and this is i'm going to start with eric here so um you know from even these poll results it sounds to me like your decision um for both of you kind of does align with what the majority of folks on the call might be doing for this year. So I'm gonna ask in your specific case, when did you make the decision to attract and want to host interns in summer 2021? And who was involved in those conversations? Um, and then beyond that point, what were the major talking points and considerations when coming to that conclusion? Absolutely. So I think the first thing that is important in terms of this conversation is from a company perspective, the way that we're looking at summers on campus, conferences, internship housing, which is we see it as a growth area and we see it as an area that needs resources put behind it. And so it was never a question on whether or not we were going to be working towards or and trying to recruit for summer 2021. Um, after most of summer 2020 was canceled, it was, that was the imperative from the beginning. So, I mean, as early as summer 2020, we were all thinking about, we've got to, this is, it's an imperative that we are preparing for summer 2021 and that we're prepared to recruit and to have offerings. Now, whether or not it was going to be possible based on the local conditions and the health situation, that's something that we couldn't control. And so it didn't, there's only so much worry you can do about the things you can't control. So it was, let's focus on what we can control, which is being ready to hit the ground running um, moving forward. And that's even with where we're at right now. I think um, we're, or I, I'll speak for myself. I'm at least a little, I'm less optimistic about summer conferences for this upcoming summer based on just how things have been unfolding. Um, but that doesn't mean the work stops, right? So we're constantly just thinking ahead of what, what do we need to do? Where do we need to go? What do we need to be doing? And so as we've had conversations at all of our sites, um, and Rachel talked about this a little bit as well, is that the, the loss of revenue from summer 2020 was had a big impact on our institutions and our sites that weren't able to have those conferences. And so that obviously is one of the considerations. And it, it then becomes what happens if we, or 
what, what will it look like with summer 2021 where we, we maybe are able to get some conferences back in place, but we're not gonna be at the levels that we saw uh, mm -hmm. at summer 2019. And so just from a very early, early on though, we were like, we've got to be working towards this because if you're not ready to hit the ground running, when people are ready to start booking your conferences, booking internship housing, all those things, you're gonna be behind. And so, you know, regardless of what happens, even for summer 2021, we're already thinking about and talking about summer 2022 and what are the things that we need to put into place to be ready and prepared because it just, it's such an important line of revenue for our, our sites and our institutions that we can't, we can't put it off to the last minute. And I think, I imagine most of the people on this call um, have worked in summer conferences or summer housing mm -hmm. for, for a while. And I think we all know that summer is typically a little bit of an afterthought and it doesn't always get the resources directed towards it that it, it needs for the level of success that we expect for it. And um, if nothing else, this should be a wake up call that we've got to have those resources available. We've got to start thinking about our operations and how do we, we make our operations great? How do we provide outstanding customer service? How do we provide, how do we start marketing in ways that we haven't marketed before to grow our business? Whether that's internally or externally for the marketing, those are all considerations and things that, that we're working on with our sites on a, a daily basis. So that's kind of the big answer to that question. But yeah. then to drill down just a little bit more, again, it's all been on a site by site level. And I think the other thing that we all probably could agree on is that higher education is a pretty conservative field in terms of risk and risk avoidance is a big thing that a lot of our institutions are um, pay a lot of attention to. And so that's been the hardest thing is assessing the risk moving forward and how do we make, make those decisions. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we obviously we've learned a lot over the last six months about protocols for having students on campus and what does testing look like? What does occupancy look like? How do we do social distancing? What kind of amenities are open? And so what we're seeing at a lot of our sites is how do we take what we've learned in the last six months and start to tweak those for a summer operation. And, um, and that's, again, as well has been driving a lot of the decisions on do we open or don't we, and what do we open for? And um, what we've seen though, for sure, is that the willingness to open up for internship housing has been a lot more, people are a lot more willing to have that conversation and to entertain that than the conversation about conferences and events. And so, um, so it's been pretty easy to move along with summer internship housing and to kind of get that moving forward at our sites versus the conversations that are happening around conferences and events. And a quick follow-up, Eric, on how you mentioned the, um, the preparation for the, for the ensuing summer, right? So you said it was summer 2020 that made you think about summer 2021 and you're even you know starting to think about summer 2022. Is that a normal time frame for when you're thinking about the next summer and what you need to do for it? Or is that more of an outcome of the circumstance that we're in right now um, where you're needing to want to do some more planning? I definitely think it's an outcome of the, uh, the time that we're in right now. Because um, I think, you know, it gets, again, it, we, we get so busy in our day to day, it can be hard to think long term, right? Like, I mean, it's just, it's really hard to, to devote resources to 18 months from now when we're just trying to deal with what's in front of us today. And so, um, <laughs> that's definitely been a big part of, of it is, is having some, um, seeing the times that we're in and just trying to think ahead of what, what, what is it gonna look like in the future? Got it, thanks. And Rachel, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Eric. So when did you make the decision for summer 2021? And you know, what were some of the major talking points in consideration for you in San Jose? Sure, thanks, Corey. Um, some of it's probably a little similar to some of what Eric talked about. Um, we actually did start thinking about it as well last summer in summer 2020, and we kind of had a 
unique situation occur, although maybe this happened in other places too, but um, we, we had planned obviously to have quite a few interns for summer 2020. Like Eric mentioned, um, most of them canceled because their internships went virtual as well. So they didn't need to come. Um, we actually still had some that, that wanted to come. So we were ready to house them. And then the university in May said, no, we can't house anyone. Went back to that you know, risk. They're, they weren't willing to take that risk. We were still gonna have summer residents. We were still gonna have athletes on campus as potentially, um, but they weren't willing to take outside people. Then they came back to me on June 2nd and said, okay, go ahead, we can bring those interns. Bring, bring, bring as many interns as you want this summer. And I know that came down to the fact that they looked at the budget and the revenue and realized how much money we were losing and wanted to recoup some of it. Well, at that point it was too late. I you know, flat out went back to them and I said, they've all canceled. I gave them their money back and you know they had to find other places to go. So knowing that our university kind of worked that way, um, myself and my other full-time professional conference coordinator said, you know, we're gonna get the plan in place for summer 2021. And again, it's kind of a see how it goes because we didn't know how COVID was gonna go or what was gonna happen. So we started talking about it in September and started putting a proposal together, um, which we didn't give to anybody yet because of the whole COVID surge in the winter months and knowing that the university at that point, if they had to make a decision would say no because of what was going on. Um, I think it's, it's hard because a lot of, I think the decision-making they look at is, is what's happening today. You know, it, and if, if they decided based on today, they would say no again. <laughs> But we have to kind of, we're going with our planning in terms of like long-term and also with the fact that we have been housing residents this year. We've had 900 to 1,000 residents on campus, which is only about 20 to 25% of what we could house, but it's been pretty successful. We've had very low COVID cases. It's been successful. So we added that in our proposal to point out this has been working. There's protocols in place. We can build on that and bring in these interns. And like Eric mentioned earlier, you know, it, it, it's a lot easier than groups, conference groups, which I know they will be a lot more hesitant to approve. Um, but you bring an intern in, you check them in once and they're here for the whole summer and then you check them out at the end. So it's a little bit easier of a process. Um, so we actually uh, gave that proposal to our upper administration about a week ago. And in the proposal, we told them that we plan on going live with our marketing on February 15th. Um, because I know a lot of times universities take a long time to make decisions. And my supervisor didn't want to put a date in there, but I pushed him to put the date in there because otherwise they won't make a decision. They sit on it, decisions won't be made. And then, you know, it is, it's going to be too late. Um, it was interesting because uh, we've been preparing. We actually do have the intern housing hub with unique venues. So we've been working on that site. We have Star Res, we've been working on Portal E and getting our site ready. And as we were doing that and making it live occasionally just to work on it, we actually have had people already try to apply. So we know the interest is out there and we're able to at least use that as well to say to the university, you know, look, there's interest out there. We've been successful this year. You know, we think we can successfully bring some of these interns and, and then make some money. Um, they also, we have an overnight guest housing program that runs year round. One of our apartment buildings has some hotel-like rooms that we're able to use during the academic year as well. And they actually told us to reopen that last October. So we've had some overnight guest housing, which is outside non-university folks staying with us. Um, because again, it, it comes down to a lot of it is, is budget and, and revenue concerns um, because of what has been lost. So with that in mind, you know, we have been able to house some outside people. We're hoping that that will let us um, bring the interns in as well. So we did actually start advertising on our website with dates, um, but we haven't made any of our registration links live yet. Our plan is to do that um, February 15th. So you know, I think to those of you considering it or thinking about it, I think it's really important to get all the information in front of the 
important people on your campus ASAP and to give them that deadline. I think it's it's important for them to see that if they want us to bring the revenue in, we have to, you know, have the time to do it. Like Eric mentioned, there, you know, a lot of times summer is an afterthought. <laughs> they wait till the end. There aren't the resources that we need, but we're not able to do it if if they wait till the last minute. So um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at. And like I said, um, that proposal is with our um, VPs at the moment and hoping to get it back soon. That's a great piece of feedback in terms of throwing that date in there because then to you, it's you're either gonna get a response before the 15th or you're not gonna be stuck in you know the gray zone of what do we do, what don't we do? So that's thanks for sharing that. I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, and yeah, someone had made the mention too, June 2nd last year to say, okay, yeah, bring them on. That's a little <laughs> bit late. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually jump around to actually this next question. And so we're in the lead up to this summer, right? So in some cases you're already accepting applications or you're preparing to accept applications and start promoting your availability. Um, what have you needed to change or address on your campus in order to prepare for putting heads in your beds this summer. So I'm going to start with Rachel, go back to you, Rachel, and ask, what's it like at San Jose State and what are you adjusting and how are you preparing to do that this summer? Sure, um, I, I probably mentioned a little bit about that. I think um, our first uh, step was to kind of look at what has been going on this year. Um, I also oversee some of the assignments and other housing operations. So I have a first look into how we've been responding to COVID cases and isolation and quarantine and taking spaces offline. Um, and so we have been kind of monitoring that and, and what's been going on to look at some of those protocols. And specifically, we created a housing addendum that all residents had to sign specifically for COVID that went through all kinds of things, but down to possible mandatory testing, um, if, if required, um, you know, no guests wearing masks, no, no gatherings, um, we don't have lounge spaces available, health and sa safety and cleaning protocols, um, all of the different and new things that have come with COVID. So the first thing we did was to look at adapting that to our conference program, in particular for interns. We already have a form called guest housing regulations that all of our interns sign before arrival. Um, and so our thought is that we will add this COVID addendum to it as well. Um, and I think it's kind of like I mentioned, it's hard again too, because you're planning as of today and we don't know what will happen in May. So this addendum kind of goes through if we're in the same situation we're in right now, here's the things that could be in place like masks and no guests and um, no common spaces available. Um, but if those things change, then obviously, you know, some of that stuff could open up and could be available. So all of that's covered in the addendum. It does cover that tests may be required before coming to campus, um, or we might require mandatory testing while you're on campus. And again, just being able to cover all those things that could happen because we don't know exactly what everything will look like um, come May or June. And, and also I think Eric alluded to earlier, it's location, um, you know, regions are different as well. There's different policies in different states. There's different policies in different counties in different states. I'm in California and, you know, our county has more, has stronger restrictions than the state even has. So um, just putting that addendum in place and all interns who do sign up and plan to come will be required to sign that um, a pre prior to arriving and, and checking in. Um, and so I think that was probably the biggest thing. Um, and then we have been working, like I mentioned, on getting our, our intern housing hub site up and ready and some marketing and um, updating our reservation system, which we use Portal E and Star Res. Um, and then I think we're in a unique situation. We're a little bit lucky in the fact that I am in the Bay Area and in the, um, you know, in the heart of Silicon Valley and all the tech companies. And so interns kind of find us 
almost more than we have to find them. But we do do a mailing out to um, companies and businesses in the area and interns to say, do you, do you need intern housing? So we've been working on that as well. And the other thing that Eric mentioned with healthcare, we've actually already gotten some requests from nurses um, and you know nursing programs and internships and stuff that are occurring um, for potential um, housing as well. So I think those are kind of the first steps that we've been um, working on just to make sure some of that stuff's in place so that when we have the green light, we're ready to go with our reservations and an addendum and, and can make sure everything's um, signed. So that addendum, um, the housing one was approved, but our conference one is currently with legal counsel at our university. It's very, very similar to the one we used for housing. So if your housing department has one, I suggest you, you start there because you can pretty easily adapt it to an intern coming because they're very similar to a resident. We just changed the word to guest or to intern housing. Um, but that make that will make it a lot easier for it to get approved through legal. Um, at least that's our, our understanding and our hope at this point. Are you, it doesn't sound like it, but I also don't want to make an assumption. Are you requiring summer guests to have proof of vaccination at all? Or is it more or less, there might be some testing that needs to take place regardless of whether or not you've, you've been vaccinated? So as of right now, and I think because we are a state institution, my understanding is that we will not be requiring vaccinations for anybody affiliated with San Jose State University. Um, I've been told so far that staff and faculty will not be required to show proof of vaccination as well as residents. So I would anticipate we would do the same for the interns. Um, I think, again, depending on where we're at with vaccinations in June versus testing versus cases, um, there could still be some testing. We are, we are doing mandatory testing of our residence hall students right now. And that seems to be something the university wants to continue and it will continue throughout the spring semester. So I could, I could see them definitely re, either saying, come with a negative test or do testing once you get here, quarantine until you have a negative test. Now, if they've been vaccinated, I would think they could show us that and that would count as well. But I don't think we will require someone to be vaccinated to be at the university. Got it. And kind of same for you, Eric. So are, you know, knowing again, Rachel brought this up that every campus is in a different county, that's in a different state, that's in a different region. Um, but for some of the ones that you're working on and the venues that you're, you're preparing for this summer, does vaccination proof, is that something that's coming up? Is that something that's required or um, how, what's your relationship to that? Yeah, all the conversations that we've had have been, I think, very similar to Rachel that we're not, we're not seeing anywhere where there are going to be requirements for vaccinations. Um, and I, yeah, so I don't have anything else to say about that. Yeah. I've not, not seen any not heard from any of our institutions yet that they're going to require vaccination of students or employees. Um, they're going to highly encourage, and I think that that's going to be an important part of us getting back to um, some level of normal operations, but not seeing any kind of requirement. And you know, it, it's <clears throat> it gets a little hard as well when um, you start asking about medical information from people, obviously, and that's gonna be different based on if you're a, a state institution or a private institution and we work with both. Um, and you know, and so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really up in the air, but haven't seen that come yet at this point. Yeah, and the only reason I ask is, you know, I read articles and, and you know, hear things that some people might be considering a vaccination passport or something like that. And, but it's from what I'm hearing from both of you, it doesn't sound like that's anything set in stone right now. It could be something that comes up, but not even really on your radar aside from asking that question during this session. Um, so that's good to know. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I know that I, I've seen some questions rolling in, but before we dive into those, if it's okay, Joel, I have one more question that I wanna ask you both. And maybe we'll start with Eric. You know, we, 
from the very first pool question, we're asking what's your relationship to intern housing programs. And for those, you know, who are on the call that are looking to build upon or even establish a program, I'm interested in hearing from you. Do you have, you know, a single piece of very important advice that people really need to consider for this upcoming summer? Boy, one piece of advice. I'm not good at, at, at one of anything. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe two then. Yeah. Well, I think that the biggest thing I always tell anyone is figure out your market. So if, if you've not done this program in the past and you're wanting to start an internship program, figure out your market. Who are the people that would be staying with you? And that's where you're going to see your most, I think, success in recruiting interns is um, starting to build relationships with organizations, businesses, and people that, that might be bringing those in. And so um, that the understanding your market is, is what I say for anything. If you, you know, you can't do effective marketing until you know what your market is. You can't do effective outreach. Um, and so taking that time and really figuring out what it is and who it is that you're going to be going for is important. And, you know, the other nice thing is, is that when you figure out your market, sometimes there isn't a market, right? Like, and so before you spend all this time and money building a program for something that maybe just isn't feasible for your, for where you're located, that's a good first step is figuring out that market. And then you can, from there, determine what are your, your next best steps. Um, you know, like I said, we've got sites all over the country, including in, in some pretty rural places. And like, just honestly, internship housing is not going to be a winner for some of those locations. It doesn't matter what we do, how much time or resources we put behind it. It's just not going to, it's not going to make sense for where those, those sites are located. And so, but don't, like don't start with like a fatalistic, oh, it, it's not possible for us. Do the research, take the time, connect with people and figure out what it is. And, and then you, you've got just a better foundation to move forward for other things. And so, um, and, you know, and that's not COVID related, but that is something that, again, with more, with limited resources, something that we should all be doing in the COVID area is, understanding our market better and then putting resources towards what makes sense instead of just kind of, you know, making up a, a flyer and sending it to an email list that might be going to people that just, it doesn't make any sense for. So knowing your market is always going to be my number one thing that I would say, whether it's for internship housing, conferences, anything like that. Awesome. Good piece of advice. And yeah, every aspect of business operation, right? Um, Rachel, same question. So for folks, again, uh, just to reiterate who might be looking to build and, and establish or even grow upon an existing program, what's your one piece of advice specifically for this upcoming summer um, for the folks on the call today? Sure, I think um, kind of from a more operational standpoint, and I think I've kind of alluded to it a little bit before, but um, kind of looking at your year round housing program, like what they're able to do now and paralleling and relating that to um, the intern program and what you can do in the summer. Um, you know, while I know that universities don't like taking the risk and think that you know, these outside people could be riskier than our current students, um, they're, they're very much the same. And so I think looking at that and then showing what you can do um, is, would be important. And so in terms of, you know, our current residents leave on the weekends, we don't know where they go, they travel, they come back. Um, that's as much of a risk as bringing in an intern who's going to come here and do their internship and probably work so hard they they're barely on campus anyway except to sleep um and then leave at the end of the 10 the 12 to 14 weeks or 10 to 12 weeks that they're there um so i think looking at how that's been successful and showing what you can do and and the things that you can put in place you know we're looking at contactless check-ins contactless inventory sheets everything docusign or or online through star res if you have star res or other platforms that you use and 
I think looking at some of the, those are some of the operational details that we put in our proposal to the university so that they could see that there's a way to successfully run this and then make back some revenue, which is the important piece that they'll look at in the end is, are we gonna make some money? So I think kind of seeing how you can do some of those things um, and again, mirroring it to what's been successful at your school during the year, because you've already been doing it. So showing, hey, we've been doing this for, for eight months, it works, we can do it again, and here's how, you know, with bringing in these, these outside interns. And then maybe not going too big. I know, you know, I, we usually have about 200 interns, we're hoping for 50 this summer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to keep it small, obviously, we're spreading people out, one per room, two per apartment, single bedrooms, but we're also um, still giving just not discounted rates, but if somebody stays in a double bedroom by themselves, we're going to give them the double rate. So looking at ways you can also attract the interns in terms of that, because they don't have the option to pick a roommate and pay the double rate. Well, we'll still give you the double rate this year and you'll have your own room. So mm -hmm. kind of looking at some of those operational things and, and putting those details in there that shows ways that your program can be successful, I think um, would probably be helpful. Um, for people to at least to grow their programs or, or to even start out. And I know that we're focusing on 2021, but do you anticipate some of the things that you're doing for summer 2021 and, and um, pivoting for and toward, are those items and, and operations and logistics, are those all things that you're anticipating keeping around for future summers? Or is this all just kind of a response to the time that we're in with the expectation that things in 2022 are going to be back to non-COVID and summers and things like that? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. I've also heard we may not unfortunately be back to normal for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, which I don't wanna believe, but I think some of the things that we're doing will definitely keep like some of the contactless check in some of the signing forms on DocuSign being able to do your room inventory sheet online. Um, a lot of those things I think will keep because it it streamlines the process It makes things easier for the interns It make things easier for our staff, you know, we, we typically would go through a process where we would check in 100 interns in one day, and I had a staff member personally checking people in at a desk and taking them to their rooms to check their room and coming back down. So that was a lot of staffing resources. Um, basically our entire staff for a day would have to work and um, that, that we can probably eliminate that will make it easier for everyone, not just us in terms of staffing, but for the intern, it makes the process easier. You know, they have a streamlined, click on this QR code, you check in, pick up your keys at the desk, you're good to go you know, click on here to fill out your inventory sheet. So I think a lot of those things um, are, are good resources moving forward that we'll keep. I'm hoping we can definitely get rid of the COVID addendums and the COVID guidelines and all of that other stuff that we have to put in place this year. But I think a lot of the other, um, other pieces um, can, be, can be kept to help streamline operations and that will also help with revenue as well. Thanks for diving deeper into that. And unbelievably, it's already been 50 minutes <laughs> on the call today. <laughs> so I'm going to now just ask Joel. I know that I've seen some questions come in. And Joel, um, do you have any share with our panelists from the attendees? Sure. So a couple of questions I think that jump right on the back is Rachel, I think you did get a, a, kind of touched on it, but I think people are looking from you kind of definitively one way or the other for this summer from both of you. Are you letting people be in doubles? Or are you only letting people be in singles? What's your approach for this summer because of COVID? We've de de-densified everything into singles. Um, we, we will let people have two people in a double room if, they're, if they've got a relationship of some kind. So if it's like we both attend the same university and our roommates there and we want to be roommates here, we would let them do that. But um, everything else has just been de-densified to singles for everything. Yeah, we're, we're down to singles. The only way we'd probably let people be roommates is if they're in the apartments. So they each would have their own single bedroom, but they would share an apartment with each other. So they're sharing their 
living room, kitchen, and bathroom, and they would have to have some sort of relationship in knowing each other to do that. Otherwise, um, ours will all be singles as well. Great. Um, and in normal times, um, when you do have people sharing rooms or even within an apartment when they're sharing, how do you address roommate concerns? Is that a big problem with interns? And if so, what's your process for resolving roommate conflicts when people are, are in the same space together? You know, we, um, <laughs> believe it or not, and we've been doing this for a long time, we haven't really had roommate concerns. We've had other issues that come up with interns, but not roommate concerns. We tend, we do ask in a normal year, if you have a roommate, you know, give us your roommate request, who do you want to live with? And they tend to do that um, because I think we get a lot of people from companies um, in the Bay Area. Friends tend to travel together and they know each other. So we, we tend to get the people who want to live with each other, request each other. Um, but then we also have the luxury of the fact that in the apartments, they all have their own bedroom. So while they're sharing the living room, kitchen and bathroom, they do have their own bedroom they can go to. So I think that helps. Um, and also the nature, at least what we've seen with the interns is they're not really in on campus a lot. Um, they're, they're here to do their internship. You know, we had to change our mailroom hours because interns don't get back to campus till seven or eight at night and then they want their packages. <laughs> so we had to adapt to that, which we were able to do, but they're not typically on campus a lot until the evening hours and then they're gone early in the morning. So we, I guess we've been lucky to not have a lot of those conflicts. Again, we do ask people to request each other um, to, to hopefully eliminate that as well. Right. I don't have anything good to add there. It's, it is strange, but I've seen the same thing. Not a lot of roommate conflicts with interns and I guess that's just a, a, a fortunate thing. So I don't want to look into it too deeply. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, that's how it happens. I think we've heard that from lots of people that are hosting interns across the country. Normally this is not a population where you have a lot of crazy behavioral issues or roommate <laughs> conflicts because they're busy. Uh, to, yeah. you know, all day long. They go to their internship, they do their thing, they come back, they do their thing, and they recycle and repeat through the summer. So um, a couple people have asked some follow-up questions about um, kind of some of the logistics stuff. So um, somebody, uh, one individual had some concerns about getting around the hotel tax uh, in their local area. And I, we need to acknowledge that every local and state, you know, is a little bit different. Uh, but did either of you have problems, um, and maybe Eric, this is for you because you're in so many places, do you have problems getting around like the hotel tax or a bed night tax or anything like that when you're doing interns? And if so, what kinds of things you're doing to kind of align this with your educational or institutional mission? Well, there's a couple, I think, different ways to look at it. So one um, is it's, it is 100% dependent on your location. And in some of those locations, we just pay the tax. Like, I know we all want to get out of, you know, it's unrelated business income taxes can be a pain and tracking that and everything else. But sometimes your best bet is just, just charge your residents for it and just pay it. Um, and again, that's going to depend on your institution on whether or not they want to do that. But that's your first thing. I think the way that we have it set up at all of our sites though, is that um, we only house college or university students that are doing internships, right? And so it's, that's how we connect it to the academic mission of the, of the institution ultimately is that mm. not anyone can come here and stay here. Um, the other thing that we've seen in some places is a minimum number of nights they need to be there. Um, so if they can come for two days and then leave, that's not, a, it's not like long-term internship housing, that's a short-term hotel type thing. And it would be appropriate to pay taxes in that case. Um, so that's the other thing is the length of stay that they are connected to a university, college or university as a student. And then in some cases, just, if you can do it, just, I mean, pay the tax, charge the student and pay the tax. That's, you know, it's, it's not, um, the biggest thing in the world to support the local tax base and all the resources and amenities that come with that. So that's what I'd say. Okay. Rachel, anything to add on that one? Yeah, and um, well, I think it, again, it depends on where you are. 
our, we only have to pay the non-related income tax if we bring in over a million dollars that summer, which we have been doing. And so we've just built it in and then we pay that, that income tax. Um, but if you don't make, I mean, it, depending again where you are, there could be caps on when you have to pay it. So checking into that and seeing what you're required to do. But if you are required to pay it, like Eric said, just building that in and then we, we end up paying that, but we just build it into our rates. Makes sense. Uh, we had another question from Cynthia earlier about insurance coverage. So when you have interns come in, uh, are they covered by your university's insurance while they're there? Or are you asking them to have a supplemental insurance <laughs> policy of some type um, when, they, when they stay on your campus? We've partnered with a company because we do, we require everyone to have insurance, um, a rental insurance policy because you know, the biggest thing with having people from outside coming in is that if you've got a student that damages a room or something, you have mechanisms to collect that, whether that's through, you know, the student account office or whatever. Whereas if somebody's just coming in for a few months and then leaving, it can be challenging to collect if there's damage, if a fire or something like that happens. And so we require everyone to have a policy and a lot of students can get covered under their parents homeowner policy in which case they just have to have their parents, you know, get a certificate where we're named as also insured. But then we've also partnered with a great company that um, doesn't charge that much. And um, we don't actually make the students sign up for it themselves. We sign them up and then it's just built into their rates. And so we're able to put the day that they come in, the day that they leave, it costs like eight bucks a month. And so, you know, you put $1 a week on the cost of their, their internship housing and it pays for it itself and it cuts out the middleman of trying to get them to and hounding them to sign up for it. Um, it's, it's RLL insurance. I'll, I'll put it into the chat there so people can see it. And it's just, it's just worked really well for us. So that's how we handle it uh, on our sites. Great. Rachel? We actually don't require them to show any proof of insurance, but I think I mentioned we do have them sign our intern housing guest regulations, which is basically a waiver stating that they're responsible if stuff happens. So they're, they're signing that they're going to pay for damages, they're going to follow our rules, they're going to do this. Um, and again, I don't know if we've been lucky or that these interns are just a different group of people because of the nature of what they're doing. Um, we haven't had a lot of damage and the stuff we've had is mostly lost keys and we make them pay for that before they're able to check out yeah. um, on the spot. So um, it's, it's worked out. Um, so we basically have them signing the waiver instead of uh, providing insurance. Makes sense. Um, a question about when the uh, interns are on your, uh, at your property on site. Um, are, are they able to access the rest of the institution's amenities? So can they go to the rec center? Can they go to the library? Can they avail themselves of a meal plan? Like what, what does it look like for an intern beyond just the housing portion of it? So our interns can access the rec center, the pool, the library, but our library is a public library anyway at San Jose State. It's part of the San Jose City public library system. Um, so that makes that easy. And then the dining commons as well. They are able to, we don't have meal plans, but they can do purchase meals as they go. Uh, they can walk in and purchase meals if they want to um, when the dining commons is open, as well as in the student union, things that are open eateries. We have a village market in our residence halls they can utilize as well. So they, they would have to pay for all of those things, but they are able to utilize them. That's pretty similar at a lot of our sites. There's a lot of amenities they're able to, to access still, like dining as well. They can do a, a uh, use the dining commons. Um, it depends on the rec center. That's a little different based on different locations, but it's not uncommon to have access to a lot of those amenities. Yeah. I, and I, th I think hopefully the audience is seeing what we've learned over the last few years of doing this every campus, every institution, every community is a little bit different. Um, and so really, I think that the, the answer is to check out at your place. Obviously, the more you can offer an intern, the more attractive your site becomes. 
Um, but if the rec center is not going to play or they want to charge $300 for summer access, it's probably not something that someone's going to avail themselves of. Um, by the same token, you know, um, I think Rachel would probably back up. You're not going to keep a dining facility open till 10 o'clock at night just so five interns can come by and get something to eat. So there's a balance that goes into working with this community because they are different than your typical uh, summer group. So um, I've got uh, one, one last quick question and then one, one wrap up question for us. So again, for those of you that are sticking around, thanks for hanging with us. Um, uh, for those of you, again, this summer, are you gonna be asking interns to be tested on site? And if so, who pays for that? So if they have to do testing, who's gonna cover the cost of that test? We don't, we don't have any plans to do any on-site testing at this point at any of our locations. Okay, Rachel? We haven't decided yet. Um, I think if we go the route of saying, provide us proof of a negative test before you arrive, I think we'll probably try that. And then there, it's up to them to do that. Um, if we do say we're gonna require testing while they're here, I would think we would possibly cover that. Um, we are also lucky though that the county has plenty of free options um, in our near vicinity. Um, so we may direct them to one of those locations as well. But I think, I feel like, um, which we've done for our residents right now, if, if we're gonna make it mandatory that they test while they're living with us, that we would have to provide either the test or some sort of transportation to the free location um, if we're gonna make that mandatory. But I can see us going the route more of provide the negative test upon arrival. So then it's up to them to do that before they get here. And I, you know, I think that that might be something that's even required by airlines as well, that they might be able to use that same test for. And you, you never know the actual intern site might be doing ongoing testing or requiring that as well too. So there might be some kind of partnership opportunity involved there. Makes sense. So the last question, someone asked, how has your internship business grown with the unique venues internship hub? Um, and while I know that Rachel got started last year and then COVID canceled it, um, I, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you were seeing. And Eric, since you're new to it, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you hope for. So each of you, maybe just a quick last minute on Rachel. How did it go? And, and Eric, what are you hoping for? Yeah, we just got it and then COVID hit. So um, I, I don't think we have a good reading on it, but I think the site is great. It's extremely easy to use. Um, and we were really excited to be able to take some more photos and kind of upgrade our site and add more content to it for this summer. And again, like I said, super easy to use. I have our student assistant actually doing that and working on it um, and it looks great. Um, I think the price of it, if you get one or two interns, again, depending on where you are and what your rates are, but one to two interns pays for it. Um, so I think it's definitely worth it. I think it will help. Um, I think we had seen one or two people come through who had who saw us on that early on last year. So hoping that we definitely get more as we launch that. Um, but like I said, you get one or two and it, and it was worth it. And, and it's super easy to set up and use. So um, hoping to get more from that. Um, I think we definitely will because I, I think it I think it'll work well. Great. Eric? Yeah, and I just echo that. So we're in the process of setting up our sites right now. We've got, I think, eight or nine of our sites that are going to be using the internship hub this, this year. Um, and I'm hoping to launch in the next couple of weeks all of them as well. We're, we're working on the back end. And I think, um, again, this kind of goes to the, the thinking long term, right? Like, we want to have ourselves out there and established as places where people can come and stay for internships. And this is one of the ways that we're looking at doing that. And so this summer is still obviously up in the air. A lot could happen, but we're, we're looking at the long term. And this is an important part, I think, of having us be a place that people easily find when they need a place to stay for internship housing. And like Rachel said, and this is what I've been saying at all of our sites, especially some that have been like, well, concerned about the prices, knowing that budgets are tight right now. It's like, you get exactly what Rachel said. You get one or two, you paid for the service, and every one you get after that is just, you know, icing on top of this. So it, it makes sense from a cost perspective 
And it's really, I think, an important part of our long-term strategy as we continue to grow our summer programs across the country. Great. And I can just add to that real quick, Joel, and just say, you know, last year was obviously a very difficult year to be able to pull statistics on how venues performed and how applications came through on our site. But from what we can tell in the limited time that we had, the venues that were using the pre-built forms on the profiles that come with Intern Housing Hub, um, there were an average 35 applications submitted over a two month period. And the average length of stay for each application was 70 nights, 10 weeks, with the shortest being 21 nights and the longest being 114 nights, I believe, or something close to that. Um, and then what we can tell from the venues that use their own form, like what Rachel was mentioning, kind of linking the star res application form to the profile, on average, those venues were seeing 101 outbound clicks to their own application forms. So we really can't track any kind of conversion past that, but the numbers are at least telling in the limited time and, and window that we had. All right. Well, I'm going to just really quickly here um, share my screen one last time and remind those of you that are left that we've got more educational opportunities coming. Uh, again, Unique Venues University, you can see the four courses. Uh, How to Talk Like Ted actually ran last night and has one more week to go next Monday. Uh, event Planning Management starts on February 10th, need to be registered by this Friday. Culture Talk is in mid-March, 360 degree professional and changing conversations all coming up down the road. You can register for any of those by going to the UVU website. Again, there are educational scholarships available. So if you are interested, go ahead and send me an email uh, with this information or just send me an email and say, hey, I didn't catch it really quick and I'll tell you what you need to do to apply for one. Then finally, just now we're finishing up our planning. We, we kind of took January off, but uh, look for the relaunch of our popular webinars coming up really quickly here. You'll see that information in the February newsletter or you can check things out at our resources website. And with that, I just want to thank our panelists, Eric and Rachel, for helping us out today and Corey for putting together another great intern housing webinar discussion. We will be, this was recorded, so we'll be getting this up on the website. Uh, we will send you out the survey results for the couple of questions out there that are relevant to all of you. And a couple of other extra things, like I'll ask Rachel if she's willing to share her uh, contract language agreement that she put together, and we'll make sure we put the RLL and sure link out there and Corey will get all that information out to everybody within a couple of days. So uh, again, thank you everyone for being a part of this webinar. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future Unique Venues webinar. Take care, Thank everyone. Thanks, everyone. And uh, good luck to Rachel and Eric and all of the venues out there taking on 2021. This is uh, an exciting time. So can't wait to maybe do one in the fall and say how things go. Maybe that's a good idea. Joel, put it in. Let's do it in October, for instance. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.